We're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 1. And if you don't have a Bible, and there's one there in the Psalm book rack, you could go to page 258, all right? If you open up that Bible and go to page 258, you should be in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And I want to read a verse, and then we're going to go into the rest of the chapter, much of it. And I want you to look in verse 15. If you don't know who Hannah is, we're going to talk about her in just a few here and preach about her, and you will understand. But in the moment, just notice verse 15. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord. And she was talking to a, a preacher who was a, a priest who had thought she was drunk in church, which, not, which would not have been a good thing. She said, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. She's explaining herself. And she said, I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have, and I want you to notice this statement, poured out my soul before the Lord. I want you to notice two words in particular, poured out, poured out. And would you mark those in your Bible, if it's your habit to mark on the line, poured out. And it's our message thought for today, and I want you to focus on it. This idea of when something is poured out, you think of it being emptied out. You think of it being emptied out to be potentially used for a purpose. When something's poured out, it, it's, it's spent, it's expended, it's utilized for a specific purpose. If I grab one of these water bottles in here that are somewhere and uh, over here, if I have water in this bottle and then I choose I'm going to pour it out, I could pour it out for a lot of different purposes, right? I could wash the car, I could take a drink, right? And in drinking the water, it's no longer in the bottle. And then if it's in me, it's been spent, it's been used for a purpose, I want to ask you a question. Are you willing to let your life be poured out for God? Are you willing to let your life be poured out for God? Hannah, in verse 15, poured out her soul in prayer. I don't believe it was just her soul that was poured out in prayer that day. I believe Hannah's whole life was poured out before God. I believe Hannah wanted her life to be utilized by God. I believe she wanted her life to be spent by God, to be in God's hands. We just sang the song, My Life, Lord, is Yours to Control. And I, I posed the question there, and you read the words of that song, and you sing those words, My Life, Lord, is Yours to Control. I give you my heart and my soul. I'm asking you this morning... Have you given yourself to the Lord to be poured out, to be spent, to be used for His honor, for His glory? We sang initially, set my soul afire, Lord. I'm talking about where you get consumed with God. Instead of being consumed with the world, you're consumed with God. And you understand that Jesus said, if you try to save your life, that's going to be a waste. You lose it by saving it. But if you give your life, that's how you get life. The way up in God's economy is down, talking about humility, not full of pride. That's important. And when you think about living your life for God, it's the idea of we die to self in order to live for God. And we're going to look at the story of Hannah I want you to notice it, and I want you to pay close attention to the scriptures here. In her life, she was very, very committed to God. I appreciate godly ladies. We have many godly ladies in this church. Men should lead, yes, but ladies that are godly are incredibly important in the word of God and in our local church and obviously in our families. So I want you to notice here, Something that's poured out and used up for God's glory, for God's honor. Hannah didn't just pour out her prayer, she poured out her life to God. Two weeks ago, we preached on Sunday morning about pray that you enter not into temptation. We talked about the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus and sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Jesus was willing to be poured out. We sang the blood of Jesus speaks for me. The idea of Christ giving his blood. And he did that in order to pay for our sins. So again, I, I do want you to be thinking in the terms of your own person. 
and whether you're willing to truly, truly, not just say it, but truly in practice put your life in God's hands to be used by God for His glory to where He would pour it out. I was pondering this. I didn't even realize Travis and Katie were going to dedicate the baby today on last Monday when I was meditating in this scripture and I felt pressed about preaching this subject this Sunday and then I found out they were having the baby dedication and often we go here and reference this story and you'll see why in just a few moments if you don't understand what it is and and I feel like the Lord knew all about that including we stand here and we dedicate a child and Pastor Clark made the question made the statement they're dedicating themselves to raise your child for the Lord and the whole idea is, you say, where, where's that kind of stuff come from? Because watch, if you're a Christian, you're not of the world. If you're a Christian, you're not, you're not to be spending your life for the world. We're to be having our life poured out for the Lord. And Hannah was consumed with God. I want to ask you a question. What consumes you? What consumes you? Now think about it. What consumes, what, what do you think about? What do you give your time towards? What's in your heart? What are you passionate about? Yeah. Hannah was passionate about the Lord. She was passionate about the things of God. And she was willing to be poured out, to have her life used by God for God's glory, for God's honor. Go, please, in chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, and Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. So we see here polygamy. And in the Bible, you see some people in the Old Testament that had more than one wife. In the beginning, God gave Adam a wife. I think this was man's idea along the way. Whenever you see it going on in the Bible, they always had issues. And in the New Testament, Jesus in Matthew 19, 4 through 6, reinstates with his words on earth God's original intent for one man, one woman, and that's also one of the requirements of a bishop or a pastor. And we know that from 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. So I just say that for some of you look at that and say, what is that? I agree. What is that? And in the Bible, there's never good things that come from it. But, again, it was part of culture at that time. Hannah was one of the wives there, Penina the other. And I want you to notice that here is a problem because Hannah had no children. And I want you to notice as our first point here, per, first thought here, Hannah's providential problem. Providential problem. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, keep reading. This man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice. So they would go to this place called Shiloh. It was around 20 miles from where they lived. They didn't have a car. It would have been quite a journey. They'd go up once a year, take the whole family, take the animal for the yearly sacrifice, and they would go there. And part of the animal would go for the sacrifice itself. In the Old Testament economy, you heard us singing about the blood of Jesus Christ. He's the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. But the Old Testament, the Jewish system there with the temple, tabernacle, here at Shiloh, the house of God, there was a sacrifice done. And so they'd go up, and part of that was the sacrifice. Part of it would be a time of feasting. And so they'd make this journey, and Elkanah was a good man that loved God, and he would make sure that yearly they would do that. And they came unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. So after you'd have the sacrifice, there would also be the feasting, and Penina and her children, she had children, they were given portions. But unto Hannah, he gave a worthy portion. In some way, this portion was more significant. It could have been more. It could have been maybe the best part of, you know, if you go out for a steak, some of you like ribeye, some of you like filet mignon, whatever, whatever, make you hungry for lunch. But the thought would be this. Listen, she got a worthy portion. It was a better portion and notice why, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. The Lord had shut up her womb. And we saw that in verse 2, Hannah had no children. This was a decision that God made. That initially, and in their marriage, Hannah had no children. The Lord had 
shut up her womb. Providence, I'm calling this a providential problem. Providence is God's hand at work in your life. Would you all say that with me for those of you who remembered it? Ready? God's hand at work in your life. That's providence. You look at the early writings in our country, the word providence was used often. You have the pilgrims coming here, you have the founding of our country, and so many times they could not deny where God stepped in. And so providence is God's hand at work in your life. For instance, it's no accident that you're in church today. Providentially, God has you here for this moment in time. Well, I decided, yeah, 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 I understand that. We have human will and free will, and God lets us do that, but that doesn't mean God's not working. Say, so God doesn't even know me. Oh, he knows you. He knows where you live. He knows everything about you. The Bible says he knows how many hairs are on your head. So God is at work. And providentially, he allows that Hannah is not having a child right now. In fact, it goes so direct as to say he shut up her womb. So God decided this, but to her it was a real, real problem. Because of this, Hannah had great grief. Now we already saw Penina had children. So look what happened in verse 6. And her adversary also provoked her sore. Penina, on whatever level, provoked, poked at, Hannah, for the fact that she had no children, notice what the Bible says, for to make her fret. So whatever Penina was saying to Hannah, she was stressing her out. Can I get a witness right there? Some of you are feeling like, yep, that's me, stressed out, full of fret, and that's where Hannah was. And so Penina, she's got her kids there, and she's making fun on whatever level that Hannah had no children, it wasn't very kind. Again, these double marriages always had issues because the Lord had shut up her womb, and as he did so year by year, talking about Elkanah taking them up for the worship time, when she went up to the house of the Lord. So every time when they went there, maybe it was her jealousy from Penina about not getting the best portion. For whatever reason, this was a time of year when they would have this incident. And it was a big thing. And they went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Penina is provoking, she's poking, she's causing stress and fret. Therefore, here's a sad thing. Hannah, she wept and did not eat. She was so bothered by what was going on here. She was so upset that she did not eat. Now, we know she prayed. It could have been a prayer and fasting thing. It could have been she was just troubled. I think it's probably a combination of both. But she was so upset, it was to the point that she did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? Why eatest thou not? This is supposed to be celebratory. But it's not. She's weeping. And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? Now, stupid things men say, right? You ladies, you're just, look at that idiot. What was he thinking? Not that she didn't love her husband, but in this situation, no, he was not better to her than ten sons, obviously, or she wouldn't have been weeping and not eating. So she's really troubled here, and this is all going down the way that it is. Then said Elkanah, her husband, I'm sorry, verse 9, so Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul. Mm. She wept. Brother Charlie, what is bitterness of soul? Her soul, her heart was full of deep sorrow and pain. You ever have sorrow that it hurts? Hannah had bitterness of soul, please hear me, but she did not have bitterness towards God. She had bitterness of soul, but she did not have bitterness towards God. You're going to have tough things in life. There's no doubt about it. These problems were very, very real to her. She had the adversary, Penina, who's provoking her. She's dealing with her own anxiety, her fret, her stress. She's got... Elkanah, he's not happy because she's not happy. And she can't figure out what to do, and she's troubled, and she's stressed. You know, there's going to be some things in life you don't understand. There's going to be some problems that you never saw coming. Boy, we're young, you set out to live life, and you figure, this is the way my life's going to go, and then it goes differently. 
Sometimes that's physical. Sometimes it's here in the mind, mental. Sometimes it's in your spirit. Here she's very greed, emotional. Sometimes socially, relationships. Again, here she got trouble with her and her husband because he's not happy about her not being happy. And she's got this other woman. And how'd that happen? And she's got kids. I don't have kids. Social. Sometimes it's financial. People struggle. It's the number one cause of divorce, finances. Sometimes it's spiritually. People intended to live for God and things went aside a different direction and people are dealing with that. And I don't know all, and I know a lot of problems in this room. I could just stand here and just start off the cuff. As I look at people, I can talk about problems that people are going through. I mentioned in my prayer here to God that there's people here dealing with cancer in a very serious situation. Don't feel well, and yet they're here in church because they want to be in church. They're depending on God just to get them literally through the service. And problems are real. And you know, you don't always understand. Sometimes you can look, well, because of this and this, that's how that happened. But even in those situations, sometimes you look and say, well, I thought initially it was going to go that way, and I see now how it happened, but I don't know why it happened. And Hannah didn't understand, why is this happening? Why is this going on? And it's grieving her soul, deeply grieving her soul. She had problems. Please hear me. Just because we have a problem doesn't mean that God is mean. Just because we have a problem does not mean that God is unfair. Just because we have a problem does not mean that God is unloving. God is always good and God is always right. From this side, we don't have all the answers. But from heaven's side, God understands what's happening in your life. God is aware. Please hear me. God's not lost you off the radar. God knows where you are. God does love you. But your problem is real. We understand that. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is God speaking. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So here is this idea. You will have problems in your life. Sometimes people, because of what they do, cause it. Sometimes other things can bring it about. But through it all, through it all, please hear me, God knows and understands about your problem. And God cares about your problem. In this situation, watch, Hannah's problem was a God thing. The Lord had shut up her womb. He decided that. He saw her tears. He knew what she was going through. God's not sadistic. God was working a purpose. And from heaven's side, he saw, he knew, he understood how it was starting and how it would be ending. So Hannah did the right thing when she had this providential problem, something God was allowing, God ordered. She chose to pray. And I want you to look secondly at Hannah's prayer. In verse 10 here, we see that she had this terrible sorrow in her heart. She was in bitterness of soul. But notice what she did. And prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. So she's praying and weeping at the same time. Her heart's so heavy. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou would indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid. And here's her prayer request. Please mark these two words. Remember me. Remember me. Why would she pray that? She wanted God to remember her. She wanted God to hear her. She wanted God to do for her what she could not do for herself. And she's praying, God, remember me. God, you know I love you. You know I come here to Shiloh. Lord, you know at the home place I pray to you and I love your word and I love you and I believe in you. And she's praying, God, remember me and not forget thine handmaid but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child. God, here's what I want specifically. I'm praying that you would give me a man-child. Notice verse 12, when it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord. Don't miss that statement. She continued praying before the Lord. What have you stopped praying for? What have you gotten upset about with God because it's a problem and it doesn't seem as if there's going to be a solution? 
that's fitting what you want and you come to the point of near frustration or anger or bitterness to where it's like, I'm not even going to pray about it anymore. You may not say it out loud, but is that what you're practicing? Listen, when you get to the point of dealing with a problem that has you weeping, when you get to the point of having a problem that's giving you bitterness of soul, when you have a problem that's so strong that your anxiety is off the charts, fret is the Bible word here. When you're dealing with a problem, it's to the point, I can't even eat. That's real life. And please hear me. At that point, the answer is not, well, I'm going to scheme and figure out my own solution. And I'm not saying we have no part in God using us as part of solution. But the whole point would be this. You can't do anything more to solve a problem than what you've done in prayer. Prayer is essential. Prayer is important. Prayer is when we talk to God and we have God talking to us in our heart. Prayer is when we ask of God and God answers in prayer. Now, God always answers prayer. Sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says wait. And we don't always like God's answers, but God will always answer. Please hear me. When you get down and you kneel and pray, you're not just talking to the carpet. You're talking to the God of heaven. Say, but Charlie, in this situation, it didn't turn out the way I liked it. Listen, there's a lot of things in life that don't ultimately turn out in life. We'd like everybody to live forever, but the death rate is 100%. And sometimes God chooses. And in our church right now, we have grieving people. I don't plan to call them out every service, but the Rulies are here today. Matt just went to heaven with them weeks ago. They're grieving. It's not the way they wanted it to go with dad's cancer, husband's cancer. Vic Costantino was here at 8 o'clock this morning for the morning service. And Rose Marie, he didn't see that coming, that she'd have ALS, one of, in my opinion, the most horrific of diseases. But yet it's gone that way, and I could go on and on and on. We don't always understand. But again, please hear me. God is a good God, and God is the one that through our problems, brings us into a place of prayer. Do you all understand God made us to have relationship? Now, we love to have relationship with God when it's all smooth sailing. Come on, y'all with me on that. Man, we're on the mountaintop. We got money in the bank, food in the stomach. Kids are behaving. Life is good. Wow, man, I'm telling you, it's awesome. But we go through these trials, these tribulations, these testings, that's where our faith is truly tested. Your faith is not truly tested on the mountaintop when all is well. Can you sing it is well when you don't feel well? Can you say, and I don't mean just physically. I'm talking about in your spirit. The writer of the song, It Is Well, lost his family at sea. Back in the day with a journey headed to England, he got on a ship. When he got over the spot, <clears throat> excuse me, he'd asked the captain to let him know when he'd be over the place where the ship had gone down where his family was lost at sea. And over that place and there, and he began to ponder, and he wrote out the words to, it is well with my soul. Listen, when it's not well in your life, it can still be well in your soul. And I'm not talking about just, well, I didn't get the right parking spot. I'm talking about some of you dealing with seriously deep things. And that was Hannah. It's great that she was a great woman of prayer. You sisters are not called to preach, but you're called to pray. God give us a revival of great women of prayer. You know, it used to be the stuff of songs that were written about my mother being a praying woman or my mother's Bible. God, give us women that know God and walk with God and are serious about their prayer life. Hannah was. And this problem comes, but she goes to God in prayer. And verse 12, she continued praying before the Lord. She stayed in her place when it was difficult. Problems will develop your prayer life. 
problems are your opportunity to live by faith. Your prayer life shows your faith life. Because it is through your prayer that you show your dependency on God. And problems can bring us closer to God. And when you're tempted to become bitter about your circumstances, instead pray. Prayer will soften your heart when you're dealing with hard things. Prayer will make you more willing to be emptied of self. Please hear me. Problems and praying through problems will empty you more of self. Pour it out. And sometimes God will allow you to go through this heartache to put more empathy in your heart. Why has it happened to me? Well, we don't always know. Well, did I do something wrong? Am I Jonah? I didn't say that, and I most likely doubt that because I don't believe that's the majority of the time. I think that's just our natural thing. I must have done something wrong for this to have happened. And sometimes there's Jonah stories, and if you're Jonah, you'll know that you are because when they came to him, he said, yep, I'm the problem. I would highly recommend that if you're your own problem, run to Jesus. My nephew Michael swallowed real hard right there. Don't make me sing that song. <laughs> but this thing is we ought to do it. It could be your Job. Here's the good thing about Job. Everybody stay with me. We're not going to preach that, but God could trust him. You know, God could trust Hannah right here. So what do you mean? Well, she had the problem, but she didn't get bitter. Brother Todd, she had bitterness in her soul, but not bitterness towards God. She didn't turn from God. She turned towards God. She had right thinking, spiritually speaking. She knew God is my help. God is my hope. And for today, whatever your problem is, God is your help and God is your hope. But we have to choose to pray. Do you understand? There's times when God lets the wheels come off so that we come close to him. Sometimes God lets problems occur just so we'd slow down. Problems will slow you down. Come on now. They'll slow you down. A breakdown makes you slow down. And God said, I didn't say it, he said it in Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Are you willing to be poured out? Not just poured out in her soul, poured out her whole person, her whole life. It all counted for God. May I remind you, before we move off of this thought, God himself turned his back on his own son because providentially that was what had to happen in order for us to be saved. But from Jesus' human context, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He didn't sin. We know Jesus never sinned. But he did ask why. Because in his humanity in that moment, when he was separated for the first time in all of eternity past up to this moment, it had never happened. And God turned his back on his own son as the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus Christ when he was taking my sins and taking your sins. That's what he did on the cross, and he did it all for you. Amen. And with what you're going through, as deep as it may be, there is a God in heaven who still loves you just as God always loved his son. So we don't have all the answers. And I'm not going to play happy talk and say you'll learn the answer right here on earth. Oftentimes you won't. Oftentimes, listen, it will not be until we get to heaven that we'll truly understand the wise. And there's difficulty. Difficulty. Deep stuff. Robbie, I'll call you out. I just caught your eye. I thought about your dad. Just so that second when you looked at me. His dad was a young man. 
had cancer. How old were you when your dad went to heaven? Strong man. I was there when he took his last breath. And watch as he went to go and be with God. But that's been difficult. 15-year-old loses dad. That's deep stuff. So I'll tell you, how do you understand all that? We don't understand it all from our perspective. But I know this, God can work through our problems and get glory from our story. And that's why we're here. We're here, watch me, church, not to just save ourselves, but to put our lives in God's hand and let God pour us out as he sits, sees fit that will bring him the most glory. And I know we can always go to our own mind, yeah, but because of this person and this and that and situationally, and, and you can lose your mind trying to figure out things that God doesn't really want you stressing about to the degree that you do. Now, for those in the middle of it, it's easy for you to say, and yes, you're correct. But I'm telling you, God's trying and is working the plan. Choose to pray quickly. Number three, I want you to see this. Hannah's petition was performed. Hannah's petition was performed. Performs a Bible word. The Bible says it is God that performeth. In fact, it was said about Mary when she was going to have Jesus that God would perform that. And it's the idea of it's God had the ability to get it done. God has the ability to make it happen. Her petition was performed. What she asked for, God answered. Pick up verse 17, please, with me. And we're rolling. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace. And the God of Israel, I'm sorry, where did I stop reading? 12. Pick up 13, please. Now, Hannah, I'll come to 12 again. It came to pass that she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now, Hannah, I don't want you to miss the story. Some of you don't know this story. It's very interesting. Now, Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved. So she wasn't speaking the words out loud, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli, he's the priest there, thought she had been drunken. You see, somebody just looks like she's talking to herself. And Eli said unto her, and she's weepy, so how long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. And some of you ladies right there could say, that's my testimony. And I'll say, God understands. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have, here it is, poured out my soul before the Lord. I want to ask you a question. When's the last time you poured out your soul before the Lord because of your problem? Everybody hear me, please. I'm asking you this question. When's the last time because of your problem? Instead of just stressing or trying to figure it out, where you just poured out your soul before the Lord. That's how Hannah was praying here. Effectually, fervently, she's praying her heart out with all that she has. And I want you to notice here, count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, meaning I'm not following the devil, I'm not filled with the devil. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace. Once he figured out who she was, She's a prayerful lady and had a sincere heart. He said, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition. I believe he's speaking that to her, but I also believe he's directing that as a prayer to God. The God of Israel grant thee thy petition. Notice what it's called, a petition. You petition, you bring that, your ask. Grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said... But by the way here, Eli here, again, as I speak, I really do believe this is a prayerful spirit as he's speaking it about God and to God. May I encourage you, if you have friends who have problems, be the person who's praying with them about their problems. And be someone that can get a prayer answer. And Eli here is in this place, and she says this, 18, and she said, let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way, Notice this, and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. I believe to whatever degree she had confidence that when Eli said that, that what he said about God and his prayerful spirit in saying this about God, that she actually believed it. She could sense that this was actual and that God was going to do this for her. And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord. Now watch, church. She worshiped before the Lord when she had a problem. And now she's worshiping the Lord while she's believing God for the answer. And I want you to hear me, whether it's going good, 
or if it's going poorly, no matter whether you have all the answers yet or not, continue to worship your God. Continue to be somebody that says, hey, I'm going to love God and trust God on the mountain, but I'm going to trust him in the valley. And she worshiped and returned and came to their house to Ramah. So she goes back, and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, notice this, and the Lord remembered her. Say, that sounds familiar. It is. Mark next to verse 20 there, verse 19, verse 11. Because in verse 11, her prayer was, Lord, remember me. And then see, in 19, the Lord remembered her. God heard her prayer, specifically what she had asked for. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come, about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son, a man-child. She had gotten specific about it and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. Samuel's name means God has heard. What a great name for this boy. God has heard. Heard and God heard her prayer, and the Lord remembered her. Hey, listen, it doesn't always turn out that we always get the prayer we're asking for answered in the way we want it, but thank God for the times when that happens. I love to see God things, I love to see God step in, and God does love us, and God does answer our prayer. Don't stop praying in the darkest moments, stay prayerful, pour out your heart into the Lord. And God heard and answered her prayer and granted her the petition that she had asked of God. So thank God Hannah's prayer was answered. I want you to notice this quickly, number four, Hannah's promise. Hannah's promise. Go back to verse 11. Remember when she was going to pray? But notice in verse 11, and she vowed a vow. You say, what's a vow there? Boy, it's a sacred promise to God. And said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid. Lord, if you'll see me and, and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, which means if you'll answer my request, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then here's what she said. I will give him unto the Lord. That's strong. All the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. The idea would be, listen. Hannah made a promise to God, and here's what it was. God, if you'll bless me, I'm going to give back to you what you've given to me. Let me ask you a question. How many times have you told God things in a promise? At an altar, God, I'm going to give you my life. God, if you bless me, use me, I I'll point all the glory to you. God, in this situation, if you do this, I'll do that. How many times... God, I'm going to read my Bible. God, I'm going to pray. How many times have you told God things? And here's the question. Are you coming through for what God's done for you in the sense of answering your prayer? Are you someone that's keeping your promise to God in the sense of I'm going to give you my life and my life to be poured out for you? Here's the thought, and I won't be here long. Please stay with me. Hannah was serious about her commitment to the Lord. So here's the question. Are you ready? Have you given everything to God that he's given you? God, you give me son, I'm giving back. Have you? On whatever level, given everything back to God that you've told him you're going to give him, and in actuality, we could just say your person in entirety, are you in the place where God has all of you and for him to pour out your life as he sees fit? Are you willing to be poured out? Are you part of pouring yourself out by being obedient to God? Your time, your talent, your treasure, the task God's put in your life, your testimony, your family. Well, we have a baby dedication up here today. We look at this story. Have you given your family to God? Do we give our family to God, then we pull it back? Or well, we're going to give our God our marriage, but then we don't put him first in our marriage. Come on now. We walk down an aisle and, and we have marriage ceremonies and, all right, God, we're going we're gonna to dedicate it to you. We light a little unity candle and it takes three. Is that what's happening? Or do we just say it? Hey, let's not just say it. Let's live it. Let's follow through on, well, it's too late. Hey, that is a garbage response. That's a cop-out. So I don't expect you to be that direct with me. All right, I'm going to say it again. It's a garbage response and a cop-out. You say, what do you mean by that? For us to say, well, you know, it already hasn't been perfect, so I guess I'll just not be perfect the rest of my life. 
you're still breathing, there's still opportunity for us to give our lives in this form and fashion of being poured out for God. Don't let the devil tell you quit on it. God's not quit on you. You're still here. Come on now. And I mean here on earth and here in church. God's got a plan for you. Don't go quitting on God. Don't go back on your promise. The last thought here, two thoughts, I'm sorry. Hannah's providential purpose. You said, well, you said she had a providential problem. She did. God had shut up her womb. But do you know there was a reason for that? You say, well, what's that reason? Well, look in verse 21. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord. To do what? That he may, be, that he may appear before the Lord and there abide. How all in was she? She said, forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. Tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one heap of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. Eli was the priest. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. Eli, do you remember me? I was here before and I was praying unto the Lord for this child I prayed and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. Wow. This is sacred stuff. It's sacred. She follows through on her promise. But watch, this was a providential thing. The purpose. Everybody follow me on this, would you? If she had had a child, like many of the women of her age and at that time, and just everything had gone smoothly in the way you always plan and have family, if it had gone just that way, perhaps, perhaps, seemingly, Samuel would have been raised back in their hometown, and like father, come up once a year to Shiloh and do the sacrifice and worship God, which would have been great. But God knew Israel was going to reject their theocracy where it was God who ruled and through his preachers, his prophets, and they were going to want a king in the very, very near future. Saul would be the first one, then David. And that whole transition time, God knew Eli and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and we haven't gotten into all this, but for those of you that know this book, they were already messed up. Hophni and Phinehas, watch, they were not the priests that were going to step up and take their father's place. These young men were reprobates, and God killed them later on in this book. And Eli was an old man and fell backward on his chair, broke his neck. He died too. So watch this. Hey, when Hannah's just a young woman thinking, I've got my life and this is how it's going to go, God knew way in advance that God was going to need a man of God to help lead the children of Israel. And it wasn't going to just be some normal kid. It was going to be one that there was a special touch on his life. In fact, think about it. Hannah here, she was all in. He's going up. He's not just going to go to church. He's going to live in the church with the preacher. And he's going to do that forever. She said, I'm going to give my son back to the Lord. And he's going to go there and he's going to be there. And he's going to be used of God. And we see that Samuel was a boy when God spoke to him and called him by name. Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel learned how to hear the voice of God in his heart while still just a young man. And Samuel was the one that when all the craziness was going on and Israel said, we want to be like everybody else, 
He was the one that was interceding and God worked through him to bring about Saul as the initial king. And then when it really got scary, hey, Samuel risked his own life in order to go to Jesse's house and anoint David because Samuel knew to obey God was most important. Samuel was a man of God who grew up at the house of God. But it all came down to his mom had her womb shut up there. And it brought her to the place of pouring herself out where she said, God, if you hear my prayer, I'll give you my boy back and you can have him in an entirety. That was God working in that situation. And in this moment, she could not see. But as we open up the pages of God's word, we now see what God was doing. And I don't know all of why you're going through what you're going through. But let me remind you, there's a God in heaven who has all knowledge and has all power and has all ability. And as Pastor Clark told you, whatever you're going through, you're going through. Ultimately, heaven solves all the problems. Heaven gives all the answers. But for now, would you be willing to be poured out for God and to live a life that instead of fretting and scheming, you go to God with your problems and go to God in prayer and get close to God and keep worshiping God and keep loving God no matter what the circumstances. This is what God wants from us. Yes, it's deep that you're in and your hurt is real and the tears do flow. But can you trust God? I mean, God, I've tried to serve you. I don't understand. Can you trust him? Hannah did. But Ty, what if God had never gave her the boy? I think she still would have kept going up there and worshiping. Just think that's the lady she was. The last thought, notice this, Hannah's praise. Hannah's praise. Man, she worshiped God. And look at the last verse here. I love this about Samuel. He's there at the house of God, and he, last statement in this chapter, worshiped the Lord there. You know, most often, worshiping parents produce worshiping children. Not always, but most often, worshiping parents produce worshiping children. And here's Samuel, as a boy, he's learning how to worship God too. I want you to see this chapter 2. She jumps in and Hannah prayed. Man, she's a prayer machine. If, if I'm, I don't, this feels like a Mother's Day med, med, uh, sermon or something, message. You, you ladies, if you don't go out of here and pray more, you miss the message, all right? Because she's praying again. Her prayer now is a prayer of praise. Notice how this goes. What a woman of God. And said, my heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged on my enemies. Because why? I rejoice in thy salvation. There's none holy as the Lord. Man, she just praising God. For there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not thine arrogancy come out of your mouth. That's probably directly at Penina. For the Lord is a God of knowledge. And by him actions are waved. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. Please notice, I'm going to read this for a reason. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry cease. So that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. Now do you see that providentially, her trust in God? There's times when people live, times when people die. God's in charge of all that. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. And he has set the world upon them. She's just speaking by inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God with power in her voice. The Lord killeth and make, I'm sorry, verse 9. He will keep the feet of his saints and the wicked shall be silent in darkness for by strength shall no man prevail. I want you to notice verse 10 because it's a prophecy. God allowed her to speak something prophetically in her prayer praise. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces, broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. And here's what I want you to see. And he shall give strength unto his king. Now this is pre-Saul. Okay, His king is speaking about the king of kings and exalt the horn of, notice what is called, his anointed. 
And his anointed there, that word anointed there is the idea of Messiah. And it's the first time in the Old Testament that it's listed there. And God used a lady to put it in the scriptures right there. Here's what she knew. Listen, I'm sure she didn't get all of it, but she got enough of it. She knew this. Listen, there's a king, and he's the anointed king. He's Messiah king. And here's the thought. Watch. She's going through her problems, and God used her providentially with her boy, but God's also used her in Scripture right here in a great way to praise her God. And you ladies and you men here, if you just put God first and be willing to be poured out, God's going to do some things with you that you never thought possible, and God can use you to be used for his glory in your story. Now, she's talking about the king, the king of kings, and I want to say this to anybody here who doesn't know Christ. There's nobody like my Jesus. <laughs> he is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. Every one of us are sinners. We're born with a sin nature, and we're sinners by choice. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That means this, I deserve hell for my sins. That's what the Bible teaches. Hell is a real place, so is heaven. I deserve hell for my sins, but thank God, I don't have to go to hell, and neither do you. You say, well, how do you get to heaven? Being good, joining this church, when can I get baptized? Listen, church membership, baptism, all of these things, none of them can take away your sin. There's only one who can take away your sin. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross to pay for your sins, and he wants to save you today. Some of you have been coming to our church lately, but in your heart, you don't know Christ. You know about him, but you've never trusted him. You know why you're here today? God wants you to get saved. Well, my religion, no, 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 no. You can put Baptist in front of your name, behind your name, over top and underneath of it. Baptist doesn't save. Neither does Methodist, Lutheran, Catholic, fill in the blank. Religion title doesn't take you to heaven. Only Jesus can take you to heaven. Only Jesus. And if you've never trusted the king, you need to. I'm done the message. Our God is sovereign. And God wants us to be a people who will trust him with our lives. Hannah didn't hear just have a prayer time. She had a prayer life. She wasn't just poured out in this moment. Her whole spirit was, I want to be poured out for God. I want God to take what I am and what I have and to use it for him. And I wonder today, who here needs to commit or recommit to my life, Lord, is yours to control? I wonder who needs to, because you've been maybe upset with God, or maybe just frustrated, or maybe just tired, that you've stopped praying for what you were praying for. Somebody here, this is a toughie, somebody here, you're going to have to accept God's answer. When we pray for what we pray for, and God at a certain point decides things are going to go a certain way, we have to accept God's answer and retain a spirit of still worshiping Him. And that's difficult. Difficult. May I remind you, for those answers that we don't like to hear, ultimately, heaven will fix it all. Heaven will fix it all. Father, help us, please, to be people who will be poured out. Let's stand.